We're continuing through Genesis. Brent's taken us up to a point in chapter 30. I'm going to continue on today. I, um, I really desire, I, I'm assuming there's a group of you here that do as well, if not all, or maybe you're seeking and searching or you're visiting, you're determining now whether you're going to come back again or not. Um, I hope that you do. Um, I think we're a great bunch, but we are dysfunctional, yet wonderful. We love Jesus, and uh, we want to help people find Jesus that are lost, and then we want to grow in him. <clears throat> in that, I say that because I want to experience um, all that God has for me. And I, I as, a, as one of the pastors, I want to, maybe in some eyes, the, you know, the, the main guy, but Brent and I share the teaching. We try to do this together. We got a great group of elders and leaders in the church and volunteers. Um, and, I, and, and in talking, like even the men's group on Thursday mornings, my small group, um, I want to experience all that God has for us. And I know that can mean different things to different people. So I'm not trying to define that right now. I, I often feel, and you can take this in a lot of ways, I feel that God wants us at times to move. But put that specific to you. That he wants you to move. Now, it may not be a physical move. Someone might be here today. It would be very funny to go, oh, we just, we felt like God was moving us to you know, New York, and now you sit, you know, and then that happens once in a while. If that's you, hey, praise God, I don't know any of that for you, okay? I'm not trying to tell you what to do either. But it, if you think of, because I'm going to bring this story up, depending on my time at the end, I used the, I love one of the stories um, about Jesus asking Peter to get out of the boat. And Jesus often says, go to the other side. So there's all those elements come into play. And in this story, like we've been learning, it's often based upon the deeper and big story, the promises of God. So what God's going to do is he's going to constantly bring us back to his promises. We've seen that. What happens? My approach today is with fear. What happens is we are stuck. We get afraid. And what fear does in a lot of us, if not all of us in some capacity, Fear can paralyze us into staying put, not getting out of the boat, to use that terminology from the story of Jesus and Peter. And maybe the answer is, what, what I want to bring up today for a reason I'll get to in a moment, is maybe we need to like, counteract or we need to have God work through us getting rid of our fears that paralyze us into a place, a position, a spot, and actually have a healthy fear of God. And so I'm, I think it's a whole series on the fear of God, but I've been wanting to talk about it for a while, and then this, this scripture came up from our story today, which is a lot, but I'm not going to read it all. But I wonder then, to kind of set that stage for you, where do you hear, if you do, where do you hear God in your life, maybe right now, or have heard, or you're going to at some point, where do you hear God say, because he says this all the time, through angels, through Jesus, through people in the Bible, and he still speaks today this way, do not be afraid. Where do you hear God saying, don't be afraid? Where do you feel him wanting, like you want to experience more from him, or you feel like there is physically a move or something going on, or a change needs to happen, or you're stuck, we're going to talk about it in a minute, in a pattern, in a place, and you feel God saying, don't be afraid because what is paralyzing you is fear. Various fears. I'll bring some up from the story in just a moment. Some of this came up for me when I thought about this and the fear of God concerning the ocean. My mom would remember better. She's here today. I'll probably talk to her afterwards. But it seems like we went to Disneyland when I was a kid all the time. We lived down there in Long Beach. We went to Disneyland all the time. Now, us older folk, I'm 58, man. I'm moving towards 60. I know I don't look like it. <laughs> but back in the day, you go to Disneyland and you bought books of tickets. I know, it's shocking to think. One of the e-ticket rides, that's the highest level, man, because when you ran out of e-tickets, 
you can't get on the good rides anymore. And so this e-ticket, one of the rides was this, I, I think it might have been 20,000 leagues under the sea, the submarine ride. Does anybody remember that? When I was a kid, I felt like I was getting in a real submarine that I was looking out windows and seeing real fish, real mermaids, real stuff out there. It felt real to me, like we are 20,000 leagues under the sea. Since that time thinking about it, there was an element, maybe you experienced this, and this has to do with fear and the fear of God, where I am experiencing this beauty and wonder and awe in the ocean, and at the same time, I am terrified, horrified. When I lived in Huntington Beach, I went down to school down there to Bible school because I loved Jesus and I wanted to be at the beach, and I felt his call there, and so I went. It was very risky. It was dangerous. I lived in Huntington Beach for a while on 8th and Orange, two blocks off the beach. I lived in Newport for a year plus till they kicked me out of the house on, on the sand in Newport. I'm not a surfer, but I acted like one. I bought a board. It was shaped. It was designed the way I wanted. It sat in the house. I barely was able to surf, and then I felt God call me back to Bible school in Salem, Oregon. Ugh. <laughs> Went there for a couple years. There was something, I would just try on little waves out in Huntington, and there was something. I'd go to the wedge and watch them body surf down there, if you know where that is. And there was something, even in shallow water, that for some surfers was nothing, baby stuff. They're putting their babies and dogs on there, you know, and I'm out there. And there's something about it, though, that is incredibly beautiful, and at the same time, I think a shark's going to eat me. There's an experience with God that I think, we feel like that. I just watched, so I love, I love surfing in the ocean. I just, there's probably, there's a spiritual stuff there too, but I don't really do it. I watched this, it's about a hundred foot wave, this surfer surfing, I think it's called Nazare. It was in France or something like that. One minute, just years ago, this wave was unsurfable, unknown. And then they discovered a guy surfs it for the first time and now it's like a big deal for a lot of surfers. It's a great documentary. One of the things that they said in there that I thought was very interesting concerning the ocean and my life and my connection and the fear of God is there is this awe, this power and wonder that you must respect and have reverence for if you're going to go out there. You can't take it lightly. It's serious. Or you will die. And there's that element, I think, of God that, we're, that I'm walking through with you. The mystery, the awe, the wonder. One of the greatest wedding gifts for doing a wedding, a ceremony for somebody, and I, this isn't my charge, my fee, is they flew Heidi and I, my wife, to Hawaii, and we did the ceremony on the beach. So if you're thinking about getting married, it's a great trip. I do a great job, okay? <laughs> but... We went, they gave us a few days just to go enjoy. We went out on a boat and sailed way out in the ocean, put the, the snorkel in, the mask on, and I don't like breathing underwater or trying, so I, I really can't do it, but every once in a while you stick your head under, breathe real fast and heavy, you know, and look around and you see this deep, beautiful, awesome, immense, and terrifying body of water. I wonder what you're afraid of. And if that perspective of God that we had, this immenseness and beauty and wonder, and, and almost, the, the word is, it'll be in here, we'll get there in a minute, is terror. <laughs> it's interesting to describe God that way. If that should drive me in my decisions, not the, I'm afraid of change. I'm afraid of what somebody's gonna say. Because some of you are paralyzed by that. You feel the God of the call of God on your life, and yet you're paralyzed by fear. 
And I, I'm with you, man, I desire for us. I don't know what it means to you, and I know there's extremes of what people say it means, but I want to go, there's an old, old Christian song too by Delirious, I want to go deeper, I think was, I want to go further with God. I want to hear him speak. And at the same time, I'll tell you what, I want to jump right back in the boat, man. So I don't know where you're at today. What are you afraid of? Fear can often reveal who and what I love. Fear can reveal my insecurities, my priorities, my heart. Maybe it's a fear. I've done a lot of services lately of people that have passed this earth present, you know, in, in physical presence. Maybe it's a fear of death, my future. As I get older, I think about that too. There's even, it's interesting, it just popped in my brain is that like one of the struggles might be the fear of what could have been. Regret. You know how paralyzing that is to some of us. Fear of being unhappy, fear of losing freedom. We're experiencing things like that. Fear, it can keep us frozen in destructive patterns, destructive places. And here's what's shocking with destructive people. Cause us to remain uncomfortable, uh, avoid conflict. Fear can keep us paralyzed, frozen, immobile in a place other than where God wants us to be. We can forget his greater story and the great good God that he is because of fear. And yet we're told to fear him. The enemy would love to have us live in fear and be afraid of God. Because there's a difference between being afraid of God and fear of God. You know why? Because one of the things that came up for me, I'd like you to think about this, is when we are afraid of God, when the enemy gets us to, be living, to, to live in fear, we're easier to control. And here's the deal, too. I, I, if you're afraid of God, let me just throw it out to you. Why would you follow God? So religious history has a lot of, you need to be afraid of God. He will strike you dead. And it's based upon sin. Sin is evil. Sin is bad. 100%. I'm not trying to downplay that at all. It's destructive. But, man, some of growing up, listening to certain preachers and teachers and things, they're creating fear in you. And they're asking you to be afraid of a God that at the same time says, fear me and come, I love you. That doesn't go together to me. And if you're afraid of God, why would you follow God? No wonder it's a struggle for the people that we look at in Genesis. This is, they're just kicking off life with God. Some of them are horrified. Why would you follow him? In our story, Brent brought us up to a certain point. The next two weeks are going to be awesome. Next week, man, I'm really looking forward to talking to, to, with you about something that I brought up weeks ago that I'm going to come back to. I, I think it's going to be awesome about forgiveness and, and, and being free. But up to this point, a, a Jacob has been living with Laban, his father-in-law, and then Brent talked about Leah and, and Rachel. He has worked... Um, he has worked for Laban for 20 years, we're going to look at later in the story. 20 years. And he's done. It's time to go home. It's, it's time to get rid of the familiar and the comfortable spot that he's in. And in this story, in the stories really that we've looked at, there's a constant fight be between fear and wavering between fear and fear of God, the good and the bad of it. Fear has kept them. You've seen it with me. We'll see it again today. They're in these frozen, it feels like repeated patterns. Because some of you in here, you are like me too. Why do I keep doing the same thing over and over again? Or husbands, your wife's telling you that. Or vice versa. Why do I do what I do? Man, Paul talked about it. Why does this keep happening? They have repeated sin and deception. They have repeated family conflict. And they also have, here's the beauty of what we've been looking at, there's the repeated presence of God. Don't you love that about God? It's one of the things that is in awe of him. He does not let you go, man. 
Even when you're running away from him, he seems at times to chase you down. He is, as one poet wrote, the hound of heaven. Repeated presence of God. Repeated blessing in barrenness. We've seen this multiple times. God is continuing to cause growth when we, some of us, are just plain dummies. (laughs) And he is repeating over and over again the promise. Genesis 12. To your great-grandfather, your grandfather, your dad. He continues to remind them. But something needs to change. Something must change. This is not where they're supposed to be. Genesis 30, verse 25 through 31, 55 is all this story today. It's really getting them from one place to the other. Let me, in your notes, you have fears that keep us paralyzed. The first one is fear of change. Sometimes we are afraid of change, afraid to let go. Jacob's had it. It's been 20 years since he's been working for Laban. He's gotten two wives, families, wealthy. It's time to change. It's time to be back to where God wants me to be, not in this place where I'm at it currently. Maybe he's at times forgotten the story of God, God's promises to him. But God is always relentless in reminding So Genesis chapter 30, verses 25 through 30, kind of set the stage for the rest of the story. Soon after Rachel had given birth to Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, please release me so I can go home to my own country. Let me take my wives, my children, for I've earned them by serving you 20 years. Let me be on my way. You certainly know how hard I've worked for you. Please listen to me, Laban replied. His father-in-law speaks back, I have become wealthy Ooh, this is kind of key for some of us. For the Lord has blessed me because of you. That's even reflecting back to Genesis 12. The blessing, you'll be blessed to be a blessing. There's all that there. Tell me how much I owe you, he says. Whatever it is, I'll pay it. There it is. Listen. Not my notes here, but maybe for you. The enemy will try to convince you to stay in the comfortable place you were in. How can I get you to stay? How can I get you to remain there? He won't say it like that, but he, he tell me, what do I owe you? I'll pay it. You know how hard I've worked for you and how your flocks and herds have grown under my care. You've had little indeed before I came, but your wealth has increased enormously. The Lord has blessed you through everything I've done. But now what about me, Jacob says? What about me? When can I start providing for my own family? Hey, we have a fear of change. And so we become frozen in place. The rest of that chapter goes on and it talks about how they deceive and steal each from each other. The sheep and the goats, they do things with twigs and, the, and looking in the, the water and they're ripping each other off. They're trying to manipulate each other. They're afraid of what they might lose. So they try to stay in the spot because it's comfortable, because it's easier, because they're afraid of change. Convincing themselves that maybe this is the right place to stay. As a result, Jacob becomes very wealthy. Lots of sheep and goats. Lots of servants. Lots of camels. Lots of donkeys. He's just wealthy. Sometimes change means losing what's mine. So what happens often is I'll try to work it out for myself. Figure it out. Manipulate it. And then maybe you want to write something like this down. Yesterday I was working through this and I wrote down for me, success isn't always a sign to stay put. Success isn't always a sign to stay put. This comes back to having wisdom from God that we'll talk about in a little bit and understanding who he is, what he does, so that we can make a decision to move forward or not. But success does not always mean that you should stay put. Fear of change. In Genesis 31, 1 through 3, we find that he says these words. We we find, continuing the story, Jacob soon learned that Laban's sons were grumbling. So now it's just impacting. There we go again, family conflict. 
Jacob has robbed our father of everything they said. He's gained all his wealth at our father's expense. People turn on you, criticize you, critique you, all that. And Jacob began to notice change in Laban's attitude toward him. Then the Lord said to Jacob, here's a reminder of the promise. He's struggling with change. He's tried to manipulate and continue to take for himself. But God has to step in like he does when we are struggling with change. And God says, return to the land of your father and grandfather and to your relatives there, and I will be with you. God is with you. God is with you. If you're afraid of change today and that is paralyzing you, God is with you. Second, we also have fear of punishment, or you might say fear of conflict, of confrontation, of being hurt or wounded. Let me just tell you part of the story. Jacob calls his wives in. He's struggling with this. Now God has spoken and said, get back to the land of promise. 20 years is enough. I want you to move. I want you to go. Don't worry about change. Listen. He calls Rachel and Leah, his wives, in from the field. And he said to them, I've noticed that your father's attitude toward me has changed, but God, the God of my father, has been with me. You know how I've worked for your dad. But he's cheated me. Change my wages, but God has not allowed him to do me any harm. But fear of harm can keep us paralyzed. Fear of being wounded, fear of being hurt, fear of whatever it is connected with that punishment, especially if you're afraid of God, then you're worried about making a move because you think, you think he's going to be mad at you. And he tells them, God spoke to me in a dream. God reminded him, I'm the God that spoke to you at Bethel, the place where you anointed the pillar of stone and made your vow to me. Get ready to leave. Return to the land of your birth. And here's what I want you to think about with me. Rachel and Leah responded, that's fine with us. We won't inherit any of our father's wealth anyways. He's reduced our rights. And after he sold us to you, he wasted the money you paid him for us. All the wealth God has given you from our father legally belongs to us and our children. So they said, this is what's interesting. So they said, go ahead and do whatever God has told you. It's one thing popped in for me this week. My fear of punishment from others, in this case, the wives and Laban, or even if I think that about God, can cause me to be immobile and immovable. Okay, think about this with me. If, in your fear of punishment, those closest to you tell you they are with you, have your back, and God shows up, I'm able to move better. Put that in a marriage. What if the wives would have said, you know what, do whatever you want to do, we aren't going. Not happening. We got a lot of wealth here. We are afraid of change. We are afraid of what our dad's going to do to us. We're staying here. But when someone has your back, I don't know about you, and marriage is a big picture of this. The biggest picture is God himself. But when someone has your back, listen to, why do I think small groups are important? Because I am creating a community right now of men on Thursday morning at 6 o'clock and through our texting and through all whatever other app we're using, I don't know what it is, but I believe, and through the prayer stuff that I see happening with some of you, I believe that, that your, Ron, I got your back, exceeds my fear of punishment or being alone. What's that like in a marriage? When you aren't on the same page, it is hell. It's hell. But when my wife, and my wife's tough, man. I mean, you do not mess with Heidi. I don't mess with Heidi. And you mess with me, you mess with Heidi. I like that. I do. When I feel... And when I know that she has my back, I don't know what it is. I don't know if any other men feel this way. I feel like I'm Superman. I do. And I believe 
that there are women in here, wives, you feel the same way when your husband's got your back. What about when you do that with your kids? What about when you do that with your community? It's life-changing. Ron, when your fear level is way up here, man, I got, got my back people way up higher. You could do this, man. When I fall, we lift each other up. That's, I need that kind of stuff. But a fear of punishment, of confrontation, of conflict, that'll, that'll paralyze us. There's also the fear of being wrong. So a lot of us don't make moves for God when we feel him speaking because we're afraid we're going to be wrong. And then there's that punishment piece. God's going to be mad at me. What if I make the wrong choice? Is God the only voice I should listen to? Mm, that's a big one today. Maybe I should cover my bases with other voices, and in this case, other idols. Fear will cause me to choose other idols, listen to other voices to lead me. For me, too many voices feed my fear. Sometimes it's just, run, quit asking for so many opinions because everybody's got one. In the story, Rachel, so Rachel steals one of her dad's little gods, idols. Laban sees that the whole family has escaped basically in the night and ran out of fear and afraid of what he's going to do to him. He chases them down. And he stops them and he says, what do you mean by deceiving me like this, Laban demanded. How dare you drag my daughters away like prisoners of war? <laughs> Why did you slip away secretly? Why do you deceive me? Why didn't you say you wanted to leave? I've been saying it for 20 years. He probably said, are you kidding me? Why didn't you say you wanted to leave? I would have given you a farewell feast and with singing and music accompanied by tambourines and harps. What a party. Why didn't you let me kiss my daughters and grandchildren and tell them goodbye? You have acted very foolishly. I could destroy you, but the God of your father, this is where God keeps stepping in, appeared to me last night and warned me, leave Jacob alone. I can understand your feeling, he says in his speech, that you must go and your intense longing to your father's home. But look at what he says at the very end of his speech. Why have you stolen my gods? Jacob didn't even know that Rachel had stolen the household gods. So he tells Laban to search. Go ahead, look. I did not steal anything. There's a lot there, man, that's just preachable. But Rachel had taken the household gods. She hid it in her camel-like saddle, and then she got up and sat on the camel. When Laban comes in, he searched everywhere else, and he comes to her. This is kind of graphic, I guess, but he says, please, sir, forgive me if I don't get up for you. I'm having my monthly period. Hey, so I can't get up. So Laban continued to search, but he could not find the household idols. Sometimes we have a fear of being wrong. I felt like when I'm reading that for some of us, for her, you know what? Hey, hey, Jacob, do whatever God has told you to do. I'm also going to have a backup plan to listen to these other idols. I don't know if you ever do that. I don't think you do it to a God, per se. But what idols do you put in place there? I've been reading Walter Brueggemann a lot, you know, and I've mentioned some things from him. He said in there concerning this, the God of Jacob orders and transforms the affairs of history. By contrast, the household gods of Laban do nothing. They must be protected even by a menstruating woman. These gods may be tokens of inheritance, but they cannot impact real events. Sometimes fear paralyzes us because we think we're going to be wrong. Four, there's fear of what might happen. What if? In Genesis 31, 31, Jacob says this. After all of that, Laban asked him, why did you do this? And he says, I rushed away because I was, there, there it is, I was afraid. I thought you would take your daughters from me by force. That, those two words, I thought, create so much fear in people. 
Other stories I create in my head before they even happen don't even exist. Or listen, sometimes I create things in my head and it paralyzes me in fear and it will never happen. I figured it all out for God beforehand. Now I'm afraid and so I stay stuck. I often need to trust God that he's working behind the scenes and when I am confronted with hard choices, I need to look at the whole big picture of things. So the fear of what might happen. I don't know if that contains you. And then just a couple more. The fee, fear of being uncomfortable. For them, it's alone, losing the family. When I think it's all mine, fear keeps me holding tighter to things when God wants me to actually let go. Towards the end of the story, Laban replies to Jacob, hey, listen, these women, this is interesting that he says this, they're my daughters. These children are my grandchildren. And those flocks, they're my flocks. In f- you know what he says? In fact, everything you see is mine. Laban is very uncomfortable so he tries to hold tighter to what he has. I wonder what that does to you. Is it easier to stay in a comfortable place when God actually wants you to move? Or are you afraid of what you might have to give up because it's mine? So he wants him to make a covenant. Sometimes I get comfortable, familiar with my stuff, and I'm missing out on God's goodness and promises. The last thing is this, and I'll give you a couple quick points about how we engage in this, is there's the fear, now we get to that biggie, the fear of God. And are we afraid of God, or do we have a fear of God? This phrase that I'm going to read to you in just a moment, from 31, verse 42, and 53, it's only found two places in the Bible, and they're both right here. This is it. Never comes up again, right here. Verse 42. Genesis 31. If the God of my father, this goes back to when they're discussing and talking, Laban and and Jacob. If the God of my father had not been on my side, the God of Abraham, and the fearsome God, there it is, the fearsome God of Isaac, you wouldn't have sent me away empty-handed. But God has seen your abuse and my hard work, and that is why he appeared to you last night and rebuked you. So Laban gets that rebuke because of the fearsome God, the fear of God. In verse 53, it says, I call, this is the very end of the chapter, when they're making a covenant together after all that's happened. And he says, I call him the God of our ancestors, the God of your grandfather, Abraham, and the God of my grandfather, Nahor, to serve as a judge between us. So Jacob took an oath before they, here it is again, the fearsome God. The fearsome God. God of his father Isaac to respect the boundary line. That fear of God, that fearsome God is something that we need to land on for just a moment. Now we are not talking about being afraid of God. There's a difference between fear of God and being afraid. A religious expression, one is conveying either devotional piety, that's a fear of God, or dread of punishment, that's being afraid of God. Being afraid has to do with punishment, judgment, condemnation. That causes us to hide This starts in Genesis 3. Adam and Eve sinned. They needed to repent. But what did they do in their sin? Because they were afraid of God, they ran away and hid. That's what fear causes us to do. That's what being afraid of God, not a fear of God, does to us. Sometimes such fear is appropriately demonstrated by those who have displeased God, like Adam and Eve, and were afraid of God because of their sin. But in the more general sense, fear of God can be produced by a simple awareness of God's magnificence, his awesomeness, which draws us to him. Michael Rivas said this in some of my notes, it is the devil's work to promote a fear of God that makes people afraid of God such that they want to flee from God. Wow, that's so true. There are a lot of people out there like that right now. We want them to find Jesus. It's our heart. The enemy wants us to be afraid of God. In my Bible reading a couple weeks ago, 
We just continue. I was in 2 Kings. We just looked at the destruction, the destruction, the destruction of Israel, and it got so bad that it said, why did this happen? Or it was talked about, why did this come to a head and happen? It's because they feared other gods. When my fear of God decreases, my fear of everyone and everything else increases. And that's not good. So what is a healthy fear of God? There's a lot to this. Like I said, it's a whole sermon series, but I hope to just get you going today. This is about flourishing in God. It even seems when you look at that wording in various um, scriptures, in those two verses in Various translations, you'll see fearsome God, fear of Isaac, the one whom Isaac fears. It's a term referring to the God of Israel with regard to the fear of reverence that he inspires, the respect, the awe, the astonishment. Think of it like I told you in the beginning, the ocean. Wow, it's immense and powerful and beautiful and engaging and it pulls me in when I actually am so respectful of it, I gotta get out. It, write this down for later on. Isaiah 44. Man, read that chapter. It is awesome when it talks about God. Just a couple verses though. God says, as he is redeeming his people, calling his people back home, I am the first and the last. There is no other God who is like me. Let him step forward and prove to you his power. Let him do as I have done since ancient times when I established a people and explained its future. Do not tremble. Do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim my purposes for you long ago? You are my witness. Is there any other God? No, there is no other rock, not one. Jeremiah 32, 38, this is from the NIV. They will be my people and I will be their God. I will give them singleness of heart. Man, I long for that. And action. I need that. So that they will always, listen to this, fear me. And that all will then go well for them and for their children after them. It says this beauty about God, what he wants to do. And that when you have that fear, that respect, that reverence, that, that picture of immenseness, that it actually is good for you and your kids. And it'll put you in the place where he wants you to be. I love it too. When you go into the book of Acts and you see the church being birthed and growing, Christians were often described as God-fearing people. I mean, that was a good thing. So real quickly, what does it mean to, to, to then grow or cultivate that fear of God? If it's this giantness, which we could spend hours talking about. What does it mean to grow in the fear of God? What does it do? Number one, it pulls me towards him. So one thing to know where I'm at, is this pulling me towards God or is it driving me away? Even in my worst place, draws me in. This, this fear of God, when I see God in the way that is described so often in the Bible, it's compelling me to run to him for healing, mercy, forgiveness, love, grace. It's pulling me into him instead of pushing me away. God, that's beautiful. Hosea 2, 14 and 15. But then I will, this is, this is the prophet describing Israel coming back and God's people coming back. The her, but then I will win her back once again. After they've ran to other gods, after they've operated in fear, I will win her back again. I will lead her into the desert and speak tenderly to her there. I will return her vineyards to her. I love this phrase, and I will, man, some of you need this too. I will transform the valley of trouble into a gateway of hope. Because you're in the valley of trouble right now, and wow, you need to go through the gateway of hope. She will give herself to me there as she did long ago when she was young, 
when I freed her from her captivity in Egypt. And 44 just expresses this beauty. Now that little part in the beginning, I will win her back again, lead her, those things, in the, the Jewish Bible, so ancient language that it was written in, it said this, but now, I said this earlier to you guys, now I'm going to woo her. I will bring her out of the desert and I will speak to her heart. This is the call of a immensely loving God calling to the people, you and I, and a world out there that needs it to, to come back in love. That pulls me in. It doesn't drive me away. That's a fear of God. God, I am so enthralled by your love that you are drawing me to you. Even at times when I want to run away. It's the disciples going, where to Jesus? Where else would we go? It also reveals who he is, who I am in it. This fear of God reveals his awesomeness, his wonder, his mystery, his immenseness. Is that, I don't even know if that's a word. I just made it up. Maybe, I don't know. I know myself. I'm confronted by God in his holiness and majesty. I accept that I am the problem. I am a sinner. And then I flee to his mercy. The mercy of his son, Jesus. It reveals who he is. Reveals sometimes my place in the story. God is not a supporting actor in my movie. He is not my life coach. He is not my mascot, my manager, my mentor. If I look at him that way, I'm missing it. So what do I do? I respond in worship. To fear God is to rejoice, to run to him, the one who encompasses, embodies all these things. It's to surrender to, to follow as the first disciples did. It's the son who comes home. The woman who touches Jesus' garment. The prostitute who he stands up for and has her back. The scum of the earth that he eats with. It's the leper that he touches and heals. It's the people who are forgiven, the people he dies for. This is where I respond in worship. When I see him that way, I have nothing else to do except I give my life to you. I, I, the little idols that I put up, the other voices I listen to, they're nothing. This is you. This is why I've given my life to Jesus. When I see that, it is the immenseness of looking like that for a moment in the ocean and breathing deeply in panic, running back to the boat and saying, I want to do that again. When I respond and worship that way, one of the things that it says is I receive wisdom, insight, knowledge. Proverbs 9, 10. Fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One results in a good judgment. Hey, one of the things fear keeps me paralyzed. Remember I said, I don't know what to do. Maybe I'm making the wrong choice, listening to the wrong voice. Well, you want wisdom in that? It's a fear of God. God, this immenseness of you, this beauty of you, this love, all of this that gives me wisdom. 1 Corinthians 1.30 then adds to it and says this. Paul would write to the church later on. God has united you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure, holy, and he freed us from sin. Thank you, Jesus. But it says he is wisdom. So a fear of God, ultimately, here's where I wrap up. Here's where worship team, you guys can come back up. This always leads me to Jesus. A fear of God does not drive me away from God. It draws me to him, and it draws me to Jesus. A healthy fear of God leads me to Jesus. Because of who he is, what he's done for us, it woos me into him. And even in like 1 John and places, it casts out fear. Jesus is always revealing who I am, my need for him. He's constantly saying, do not fear, Ron. And he's drawing people we see in all the Gospels. He's walking in their lives and he's drawing them into him. I read some of it earlier to you. The leper, the prostitute, the scum of the earth. They long to be with him. What some people perceive to be the worst, the worst longs to be with Jesus. Why? Because he's a great mentor? Because he's a good life coach? Now he's pretty good at that stuff. But he is the son of God.
Jesus reveals throughout the scripture and to us today who God is, his awesomeness, his immenseness, his mysterious compassion. Ah, it's so much. If you'd stand with me, it's so much. It's a whole other sermon, but I'm wrapping it. So much of him just saying, come with me and disciples discovering who is this man. In a couple months, three months, I'll be back in Israel for the first time in four years. Checking on a bunch of ministry for us, doing some work there. And, uh, and then I represent a nonprofit too that, that I do some work with over there. One of my favorite places is the Sea of Galilee. I've been on a boat in the Sea of Galilee many times. And every time we read those stories in the Sea of Galilee type situation, it always seems that Jesus tells the disciples, if you read them, hey, we were here, let's go to the other side. Hey, we're there, let's go over there. Hey, we're there, let's go over there. And they get in a boat, and then he does something crazy with them. There's always a storm involved, it seems like. One of those places is he tells Peter, you guys know the story. We'll preach it again many times, I'm sure. Get out of the boat, and they're freaked out, right, because of the storm. Now Peter's getting out. They're freaked out. Come on. Have faith. Don't, don't be afraid. So he steps out, and then you guys know he sinks because he looks down, and he's afraid of what? the waves are doing. Jesus grabs him, puts him back in the boat. And in all those situations, when that happens and the other ones, every time it seems at the very end, after they experience like the storm, the fighting the storm, Jesus in the storm, who one minute does nothing and the next minute stops it. They always come to this place and they go, because they didn't get it fully. That, who is this man? Why were you afraid? I was with you the whole time. And I will never let you go. I will not let you drown, but it's going to feel like it sometimes. So you're going to really need me. Because you're going to wonder if I'm there. You're going to want to operate in fear. Father, today, man, I, no doubt it's just statistics that in this room there's people living in fear. Many of you're calling them to something else. In a relationship, in a job, in, a, in the heart. Someone's stuck in a pattern of brokenness and they are just destroyed because they can't get out. They're frozen, paralyzed because of the past because of what someone has done or said, because of their own fears of losing or wondering if it's the right thing, whatever it is. Free us. And in freeing us, may we fear you in such a way that we understand how immense and beautiful and immeasurable and incredible and yes, at times even terrifying you are and even the very thing that would kill us, you took care of that sin so that we could be free. So thank you, Jesus. Today, Lord, I pray that you just heal and help as we sing, as we take communion together. If some are, we remember what you have done for us and that you cast out fear because you are perfect love. So thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, let's sing.